Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Spirituality and Mental Health webinar series, Session 5, Spirituality and Relationships, Contributions to Faith and Forgiveness in Recovery. Thanks so much for being with us. I'll now turn the presentation over to Shannon Rice. Shannon? And I do need the computer unmuted. Sorry, we're doing some technical changes today. With me here in the room is my dear friend, Dr. Lisa Miller, and I'm so thrilled that she's actually able to be with us here in the Partnership Center today. My name is Shannon Royce. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and um, Opportunity Initiatives here at the Department of Health and Human Services. And we have a really terrific program today. Um, but we do have a few housekeeping items we want to mention just to make sure this uh, goes as well as possible for all of us. First, this is an educational webinar, not intended for press purposes. So if you are a member of the press, we ask that you allow us to connect you with the uh, Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs Office at the end of our webinar. We also have noticed that for some people uh, calling in to the phone number provided by Zoom, can give you better audio. So if you're having trouble hearing any of our speakers, you could use the phone number provided by Zoom, and that might um, allow you to hear more clearly. We will be sending a link to today's um, webinar recording. And because we're moving into Thanksgiving week next week, that email will be coming tomorrow. So be watching for that email. We'll provide the slides um, and the link to the webinar. And we'll also provide uh, the ability for you to register for our final webinar um, in early December. So we're excited to have you join us for that as well. Finally, we do have a really full program today. And so if you will please use that Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, uh, that will allow you to leave questions for us as we go through the program. And we will get to as many of those questions as we can at the end, but it also helps us to understand what um, our audience needs to understand more of. So it really educates us um, in our work here. So we thank you for that and I look forward to a really terrific program. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Lisa. It is such a joy to be here in person with you, Shannon, instead of several yes. hundred miles away, nearly six feet away. Yes. Exactly. And it, this collaboration has been absolutely so fruitful, so innovative. Your office, led by you, is so extraordinary. And I want to thank all of our 2,000 colleagues who have been with us now, this being the fifth of our, in our webinar series. I have heard back from many people that our collaborative webinar has seeded discussions, has seeded collaborations, mm. true relationships between people in faith-based organizations, and in mental health. So it's really working, and it's working because of the energy and the innovation of our colleagues right here with us. Terrific. Um, today is a very special day. We're speaking about spirituality in relationships. And we spoke last week about our last session about the specialness of spiritual social support and religious social support. We're speaking today about the extraordinary transformational and supportive opportunity in spiritually oriented personal relationships within our families, within our faith communities, within where we work. Um, there's two ways that we can see each other. Um, we can see each other through this sort of chronic lens of measurement where we ask each other, what do you do and where do you live and um, relationships or contracts. You know, what Very do you see? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, what do, what do what does A do for B and what does B exactly. do for C? Um, but another way is not the contract but the calling. Who can I be as in my deepest spiritual understanding for you, my partner, my friend, my spouse, my colleague? And uh, spiritually oriented relationships allow us to see each other as souls on earth, beings of infinite worth, children of God. And our relationships come about interest, forgiveness, encouragement, um, and there's a much deeper, resonant, and more permanent basis to those relationships, and they lead to renewal. If I might ask to put up, we have a new website. The Spirituality Mind Body Institute has launched our new website, and we would invite you all to come and look and 
see what we're doing and join us. The Spirituality Mind Body Institute was founded foremost to generate science and use science as a roadmap through which to help seed a more spiritually supportive society, focusing primarily on mental health, recovery, and renewal. So this partnership has been really such a fruitful way to live out our mission and be part of the larger conversation. Thank you, Shannon. Absolutely. It's been a joy. Thank you. Okay, Okay, Ken, our dear colleague and friend, Ken Parkman. I've known Ken for 20 years. Um, Ken really was a founder of the field of spirituality and mental health, psychology and religion. Dr. Ken Pargaman is now Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Bowling Green State University. Dr. Pargaman's nationally and internationally known research addresses religious beliefs and health. He studies the process by which people create perceptions about the sanctity of aspects of their life the sanctity of their relationships. And he really, it was Dr. Pargaman who put the notion of sanctification of our relationships within the family and with our friends and with our community at, into the roadmap of, of mainstream psychology and led the APA in that direction. Um, Dr. Pargaman has studied on um, the activities and beneficial effects of the sanctification for individuals and relational well-being. A strong emphasis of this work is how individuals and couples go about sanctifying their marriage and how that sanctification is a strong predictor of quality and stability, as well, because I know his superb work, of forgiveness, the topic of today. Dr. Pargaman won the 2000 Virginia Sexton Mentoring Award. He has mentored a number of now leading psychologists from the American Psychological Association. And this encouraging research has really opened doors for dozens, probably hundreds, of investigators. Welcome, Dr. Pargaman. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Lisa. And I'm really delighted to be able to be here and be part of this exciting uh, program and appreciate all the work that uh, Lisa Miller, Shannon Royce, Ben O'Dell have done to make this happen. Let me talk with you about a, a, a couple that I worked with um, many years ago. Um, in my own mind, I called this couple the grudge collectors. They'd been married for several years and over that time, um, they had accumulated a long list of grievances. Let's see if I make sure I get this thing working here. Oops. Therapy initially consisted of them coming in and um, sharing their list of grievances with me. The husband would say, when I come home from work, my wife is constantly nagging me. And the wife would respond, well, I nag you because you're never home and there's lots to do. And then the husband would say, well, maybe I come home earlier if you weren't always on the phone talking to your mother. And the wife would come back saying, well, I'm talking to my mother because you don't talk to me. You collapse on the couch with a beer in your hand and fall asleep. And then both of them looked at me as if I'm supposed to render the verdict of who's innocent and who's guilty. Until recently, uh, therapists and pastoral counselors uh, tried to deal with problems of festering anger, such as we see in this case by communication approaches, basically helping them share their feelings more clearly. But I found that that wasn't very helpful. Um, people can be very articulate about their rage, but communicating it clearly doesn't seem to help them find relief. And I found that another approach was needed, one that went deeper to the spiritual character of who these people were in their relationship. And forgiveness is a key part of this relational approach. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about for a few minutes today. Both of, both of the members of the, this marriage, husband and wife, were churchgoers. Um, I asked them whether they had thought about forgiving each other for their hurts. And they both looked at me 
as if I had come from another planet. Forgiveness was not a word in the vocabulary, but it turns out that working with them towards forgiveness was the key to saving their marriage and really a key to a life transformation for them. There are important preludes to consider um, in helping people move to forgiveness. We first of all have to recognize that it's not always appropriate. There are times when forgiveness may not make sense, when the wounds are too fresh or severe, when the insult and injury continue in a relationship, or when the offender fails to take responsibility. Forgiveness is appropriate though in many instances. It's also important to distinguish right from the start what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness means letting go when you're quite justified in holding on. But to let go, you have to know what you're letting go of. Thomas Zaz, the psychiatrist, once said that the stupid neither forgive nor forget. The naive forgive and forget. And the wise forgive but do not forget. So when we forgive, we do not forget and we do not assume that the injury won't happen again. Forgiveness is not condoning. It doesn't mean we say that what the person did is really okay. We recognize that the person who hurt us did something wrong and harmful, and it's not okay. Forgiveness is not legal pardon. You can pursue forgiveness while also pursuing legal satisfaction. And maybe most importantly to stress, forgiveness is not reconciliation. Reconciliation with someone who has caused you harm can at times be foolish and dangerous. It takes one person to forgive, but two to reconcile. And whether you reconcile should depend on whether the other person has taken steps to change. But you can forgive in the sense of letting go of your negative thoughts, feelings, and actions without necessarily returning to a destructive relationship. Reconciliation is something that needs to be considered independently of forgiveness. I like to think of forgiveness as a psychological act and reconciliation as the interpersonal act. So forgiveness may or may not lead to reconciliation. At times, reconciliation makes little sense while forgiveness makes a great deal of sense. So what is forgiveness? Well, there are two definitions of it that I, I like. One is, I'd call it a minimal definition. Forgiveness is a process in which a person overcomes negative affect, hostility, negative cognition, such as thoughts of revenge, and negative behavior, such as aggression, in response to an offender's considerable injustice. This definition focuses on overcoming or letting go of negative feelings and behaviors and thoughts. And for many people, this is an adequate definition of forgiveness. It's sufficient to go that far. But others maintain that forgiveness involves more than overcoming the negative, that it involves replacing the negative with more positive feelings, the development of positive feelings and attitudes towards the offender. Here's a more ambitious definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the emotional juxtaposition of positive emotions against the hot emotions of anger or fear that follow a hurt or offense or the unforgiveness that follows or the unforgiveness that follows ruminating about the transgression and this is from the leader in this whole area Everett Worthington replacing anger and hatred and fear towards someone who's hurt you with care and compassion and even love is that even possible or is that simply too much to ask? Well, I'd suggest that forgiveness is a process. It doesn't occur overnight. And it involves taking steps forward and sometimes steps backwards. It's very difficult to do. And I've, one, one author says it's the hardest thing in the world to do. It's one reason why many people find 
that they need to draw on all of their spiritual resources to move in this direction. Which leads to the last point. Forgiveness is inherently spiritual. It's spiritual in a number of respects. Forgiveness is deeply embedded in the major religious traditions of the world as a core value, really a core virtue. When I pointed out to my couple that I work with who do attend a church that, uh, that there didn't seem to be much place for forgiveness in their lives, it created a real tension for them, a kind of cognitive dissonance that was disturbing. They wanted to live by their religious values and virtues, and yet the mention of the word forgiveness was kind of like a real wake-up call that they weren't living by their deepest values. But because forgiveness is such a hard thing to do, we find wonderful resources to foster it in religious traditions. Encouragement from God to forgive. The experience of divine forgiveness. Prayers for the strength to forgive. Rituals to help people let go of their anger. And models of forgiveness um, from leaders in the religious traditions. I've also um, often thought that forgiveness is really a spiritual form of life transformation. When we forgive, we shift in our most basic values from self-oriented concerns, protecting oneself from harm to relational concerns to being more of a caring, humane person. I think of it as a kind of conversion experience. It's so profound in its implications for oneself and relationships. Forgiveness is an aspect of spirituality that makes it clear that spirituality is more than a personal process. It's really a relational concept. Forgiveness is one of the reasons why we even talk about relational spirituality. With that prelude in mind, let me review quickly some of the steps that are involved in forgiveness. And this comes from Everett Worthington's REACH program, which I highly recommend. Each step is challenging, and many people have to draw on their spiritual perspective and resources to progress. The first step is to recall the hurt. We can't forgive unless we recognize that an injustice has occurred. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It's not making light of what happened. Individuals have to be able to recall exactly what took place, including the full range of negative feelings that were elicited by the event, if they're going to be able to move forward. It's an essential step in the process of healing. Like a physical wound, Unforgiveness creates an emotional wound and it needs to be aired out. Otherwise, it's likely to fester. And this process of airing out the wound may be painful, but it's necessary if the wound is to heal. A second step in forgiveness is empathy. Several studies have shown that the, the most powerful predictor of whether someone will forgive is the degree to which they empathize with the person that hurt them. And this is a tall order. It involves understanding the offender's point of view, identifying emotionally with the offender, and even feeling compassion for the offender. And it's so challenging to do when we can be consumed with our own anger and pain and hurt, to be able to shift focus to the offender. And in the, spiritual, uh, in the spiritual world, one of the most important um, resources for that is to be able to see beneath the surface of other people, see them as spiritual beings, look into their own sacred core, and recognize that they, like we, are children of God. They too carry a divine spark. And there are other techniques that can be helpful in, in fostering empathy considering non-blaming explanations for an infraction, writing a letter of apology uh, in the role of the offender to try to understand their perspective, 
And just simply listening to the stories of transgressors, so they become living, breathing, spiritual creatures. The next step is being able to understand forgiveness in, in, a, in a benign, benevolent way. People can forgive for all kinds of reasons. We can forgive um, for personal reasons, just to get more control of our lives so we're not controlled by our anger. We can forgive for negative reasons. We can forgive to punish other people, make them feel smaller by proving to them that we're big enough to forgive. But the most genuine form of forgiveness represents an altruistic gift. It's a decision to forgive someone, someone else to give up negative feelings when they're in fact quite justified to have. We forgive in spite of the fact that the offender may not have earned it. And the two keys to altruistic gift of forgiveness are one, humility, recognizing the times when we too have hurt others our own weakness and our own frailty, and gratitude. It's important to remember times when we've been forgiven for our own acts, and maybe when it wasn't even deserved. Forgiveness may come from other people, we may feel it from God. In either, either case, it's so important to remember and recall that sense of gratitude for the gifts we've been given. And that sense of gratitude um, research is shown by uh, uh, Bob Emmons and Michael McCullough, really helps reduce negative affect and enhance mood. So the combination of humility and gratitude, coupled with empathy, I believe, sets the stage for the desire to pass on the gifts that we've received. It's the gift of letting go of negative emotions that are quite justified, and perhaps replacing them with positive emotions to the offender even though the offender may have done nothing to earn it. It's simply a gift. Committing publicly to forgive, we find, is also very helpful in making the transformation stick. Um, uh, years ago, I met Eva Kaur, who was one of the Mangala twins um, who had been um, cruelly treated by uh, Joseph Mangala, one of the Nazi doctors in the concentration camp. And probably, I believe it was in the 1990s, 1995, she went on TV she, on a 2020 special and declared an amnesty towards those who had injured her and her twin sister in Auschwitz, basically making a public commitment to forgive. Very powerful, powerful transformation. And finally, we hold on to forgiveness because it's not like a one-shot deal. It's not like running a race and you get to the finish line and it's over. Uh, to hold on to forgiveness, we have to remind ourselves that you've forgiven the partner. We have to get reassurance from a partner or friend or from God. And then we, we maybe have to repeat the steps of forgiveness as well. So forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. Gandhi once said that the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Forgiveness is transformational, akin to a religious con uh, conversion. It's a life that shifts from a focus on anger and desires for revenge and self-protection to a life geared more to peace, compassion, and understanding of our common spirituality and humanity. Forgiveness adds a vital and deeper dimension a spiritual dimension to our personal and interpersonal lives. It, it enriches our capacity to help people when we're trying to offer them support and counsel. In short, forgiveness is an exciting direction for our work and our efforts to help people and foster their lives. And it's likely to define the field and our helping activities for years to come. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I did not expect to be moved by a presentation on a, a webinar at work, but what you've shared is so true. We can't be 
in close relationship of any kind, whether it's with family members, whether it's with work colleagues, uh, whether it's with friends, without recognizing at times that we wound people and we are wounded by people. And so forgiveness is really a part of everyday life um, if we're going to be whole and healthy people. So thank you so much for what you've shared with us. I really look forward to the Q&A time with Lisa and uh, with our next guest, who I will introduce now. Dr. Kurt Thompson, uh, MD, wears many hats as a psychiatrist, author, and speaker. Kurt is inspired by deep compassion for others and informed from a Christian perspective. Dr. Thompson shares fresh insights and practical applications for developing more authentic relationships and fully experiencing our deepest longing to be known. Kurt's unique insights about how the brain affects and processes relationships help people discover a fresh perspective and practical applications to foster healthy and vibrant lives, allowing them to get unstuck and move toward the next beautiful thing they're being called to make. Through his workshops, speaking engagements, books, organizational consulting, private clinical practice, and other platforms, he helps people process their longings, their grief, their identity, purpose, perspective of God, and perspective of humanity, inviting them to engage more authentically with their own stories and their relationships. Kurt and his wife Phyllis live outside of Washington, D.C. and have two adult children. I look forward to hearing your presentation, Kurt, and we'll turn the program over to you. Well, first of all, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Lisa and Ben, for inviting me to be part of this. I'm uh, it's such an honor to be invited to be uh, part of the mission and work that you've been doing. And uh, I couldn't think of better work that we could be about, especially in the current time in which we find ourselves. And so I'm grateful to uh, be part of uh, such a, a noble uh, um, mission and work. I also want to say thank you to Ken Pargman. I, I think I could just um, uh, meditate on what he's just, what you've just shared uh, for the next several days, let alone several minutes or hours. And so I'm, I'm grateful, Ken, and um, I hope to continue to be in touch with you about all the work that you're doing. It's uh, inspiring, and I think it, it helps uh, me just launch right into what I want to begin to share with our listeners today. The first thing that I would want to invite us to consider is that religious traditions that we're familiar with all have a number of things in common, but one of those things that they have in common is that we human beings are here on the planet on purpose. We are here intentionally. We didn't just sprout up like mushrooms. We just happened to show up someplace. We are here on purpose. And we say that even from a very fundamental neurobiological perspective in that for us to get here, two people had to have sex. And in that act, which is a purposeful act, we emerge. Now, I can attest to the, the fact that sometimes people engage in that act and the procreation of children isn't intended. My parents were 45 when I was born and I can tell you I was not on their radar screen as showing up in that act. But I want us to hear first and foremost, all of our listeners, that we are here on purpose. We are purposed as human beings. We don't just appear. We're made as an intentional act. And what's important about that is this notion that we are people who are in the world with this longing to respond to other people's intention. We look for other people to be looking for us. I like to say every baby comes into the world looking for someone looking for her, looking for someone looking for him. And our religious traditions support this, this notion that we've been made in God's image, that we've been made as people whom God delights in, and that relationality emerges in our spiritual traditions as something that we want to create and not just something that we want to tolerate or something that we just want to have to put up with. And we see from many of the religious texts that we read that human beings were made 
not just to exist, but we were made in part for the purpose to be known by one another. I long to be seen by you, to be heard by you. You long to be known by me, to be seen by me. I'm not just wandering around in the universe on my own, just wanting to do my own thing. I long to be seen and to be known by you, and you long to be seen and to be known by me, that we were made for each other. Now, what's so striking is the way that this, as we read about this in our texts and think about this in our religious traditions, this matches what we have learned about in the field of neuroscience, in the particular field that I study in, what we call interpersonal neurobiology. It's a field that looks at this interplay between the brain and the central nervous system and relationships and how they shape one another in any number of different ways. And one of the things that we see when it comes to the way the brain develops is that in order for my brain to develop and to mature and to flourish, in order for my mind to flourish, I first have to have an, ex an experience in which my mind is actually interacting with other minds. When a newborn comes into the world, about 20 to 30% of her neurons that are in her brain are ready to go and do what they are designed to do. But another 70 to 80 percent are needed, are, are still waiting to know what they're going to do, and they need an interaction with another human relationship in order for those neurons to start to talk to each other, in order for those neurons to become integrated, as we might say, to connect with one another. And the brain has numbers of different kinds of neural networks some that do one thing, some that do another. We sense, we image, we feel, we think, we act with our bodies. We do all of these different things. And in order for me to come to a place of maturity in all of those different things, interacting with each other in my mind, I equally have to have the opportunity of my mind interacting with yours. And not just someone who happens to be passing me as ships in the night, but my mind is looking for your intention for me. My mind is looking for you to find me, and yours is looking for me to find you. And so we see that this integrated state, this flourishing state of the human mind, not just the brain, but the mind as a whole. We like to say that the mind is, a, is an embodied and relational process that emerges over time. What does it mean for us then to be in relationships that are flourishing? Well, one of the things that we see is that Human beings aren't just made to be known. Yes, I long to be known by you, but I also deeply long to, as it turns out, make things with you. All it takes is to be around a three-year-old for a short period of time before they run into the kitchen holding something that they've made. You didn't ask them to make this for you. They believe that they brought you their Van Gogh, and they come with all the delight in the world that their little bodies can muster. And they're looking for you to find delight and joy in what they've made. And they want you to put it up on their refrigerator because it's not just the artwork. It's not just the thing that they've made. The thing that they've made, this artifact of beauty, is also going to be a conduit for deepening your relationship. And so we find that we were made, the religious traditions would tell us that we were made not just to be known by one another, but that we are known by one another deeply on the road, on the way to creating beauty together. In the Genesis account of creation, we hear and read at the end of the second chapter that the man and his wife were naked and unashamed. The Hebrews had lots of different words for describing what that man and woman might have been experiencing or feeling at the time. Why unashamed? Why not unafraid? Why not happy? Why not a lot of things? One of the things that we see that's necessary then in order for us to be creative in the world, this place of relationship, that we require differentiation. In this case, the text are describing male and female, but in our world, we can describe lots of ways in which we are differentiated, differentiated ethnically, differentiated in our sexes, differentiated in our economic status, differentiated in lots of different ways in that creativity Remember, relationality is purposed to create beauty, that that beauty in created, we require differentiation. I don't make the most beautiful things, as it turns out, by being with people who are just like me. 
it turns out that I need, in order to create beauty, to be with those who were different than me. Differentiation. They were naked, as it turns out. I don't just need differentiation, I need vulnerability. The nakedness that the Hebrew talks about is not just describing a physical nakedness, it's describing the reality that human beings, by our nature, are vulnerable creatures. We don't have to decide if I'm going to be. Look, we are the only creatures that put clothes on on purpose. Now, some people put clothes on their dogs. That is strange to me, but the dogs didn't ask for this. But some people do this. But we are the ones who clothe ourselves because we are inherently vulnerable. My vulnerability tells me that I am at risk of not being okay unless I have you in the world. And my vulnerability puts me in a position, lands me on the precipice of being able to create beauty in ways I could never imagine as I'm creating it with someone who's very different than me. And so in this way, we see that we have this one notion of being differentiated, we have this other notion of being vulnerable, but we also want to be able to do this in the absence of inappropriate shame. Shame is one of the most destructive neuroaffective forces that we have to contend with, not just within my own mind, but between me and you, and then as it extends into communities and entire cultures. Shame is a competing force with joy and the creation of beauty. And so we see that we are differentiated and vulnerable, and in the absence of shame, we stand on the precipice of creating great beauty. So I'm known in relationships in order to create beauty. And interestingly enough, this strengthens the neural connectivity within my own brain and within yours. But there's something in addition to this that I think actually even speaks to something that uh, Dr. Pargan was talking about. If I'm gonna create things, if you and I are gonna venture into taking risks, if we're gonna venture into doing hard things together, the reality is we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna hurt each other's feelings. I might get angry with you. You're gonna like do something that might shame me. And part of the necessity of relational interaction is our recognition that there will be ruptures. There will be ruptures. The question is not, will there be ruptures? The question is, will we repair them when they happen? And one of the beauties that we're learning about neuroscience is that when neurons are fractured and are repaired, the connection between those neurons after a real repair following a rupture, those neural networks are actually more robustly, more resiliently connected than they were even before the rupture takes place. Here would be a question. Who are the people in our lives with whom we are differentiated? Maybe even our enemies. With whom we can become vulnerable, with whom we can ask shame to leave the room and begin to create beauty together knowing that it will require the repair of ruptures along the way, but also knowing that that rupture repair will lead to even greater resilience and greater strength in our relationships and communities. Our religious traditions, our spiritual resources point to all these notions that now neuroscience is revealing to us. As we say, science is finally catching up to what our traditions have been telling us for thousands of years. One of the things that is true about the work that I do in medicine and in psychiatry is that we spend a lot of time taking care of people who come to us with problems. And of course, that's not an inappropriate thing. We have a whole library of pathologies, whether it's heart disease or cancer, or it's psychiatric illness and mental health challenges. And it's not inappropriate that we be able to identify what are the problems in our world. If I can't identify what the problem is, I won't be able to change my flat tire. But I also want to invite us to consider that we live in a world that has become dominated by the notion of seeing the world as a problem to be fixed seeing the world as a pathology to be diagnosed in order to be treated over and against a different way of imagining the world. And that is being curious about in what way is the world a place in which we want to create the next new artifact of beauty. To identify the world in the lens of pathology uses a more dominantly left hemispheric way of seeing the world, logical, linear, but separates me from the world. 
to see the world as a place in which I long to create beauty in a state of differentiation and vulnerability in the absence of shame, I actually give my right hemisphere more space to move. This notion of paying increased attention, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, remembering we need to be able to solve problems as long as we remember that even in the course of solving problems, we do all that in the service of moving us eventually to a place in which we are longing to ask the question, now that we've solved the problem, what's the next new artifact of beauty that we want to create? Not just as individuals, because it's not good for man to be alone. And in fact, we like to say in, in, in biology, there is no such thing as an individual human brain. Now you might think, well, Kurt, that's a little wacky. Like I've got one and you've got one. But the point is that my brain, my mind is unable to flourish apart from me seeing myself in your eyes. My story is meaningless unless I can hear you help me tell it in its fullness. This is what neuroscience is telling us, that we long to be known, that we long to be known in order to create beauty in the world, whether we're talking about relationships or software or a common, uh, a, a common plan for how we're gonna lay out our city, how we're gonna do medical work, how we're gonna do farming, any of these kinds of things we are being called to create in the absence of shame, in the presence of those with whom I'm differentiated, recognizing that there will be ruptures, but already with confidence because of some of the things, for instance, that Dr. Parkman has talked about, about what it means for us to forgive and to see the power in that and how that can lead us to come into a world of beauty and goodness that we in the religious tradition would say and describe as the kingdom of God that we would realize that and in that way, create a space together in which joy and peace and shalom emerges. It's been my pleasure to share some of these thoughts with you today. And with that in mind, I'll turn this back over to Shannon. Very much. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Pargament, we've received a number of very um, moving and thoughtful questions, so we'll go right into them. Absolutely. Uh, the first question I thought was particularly interesting and uh, thought-provoking, and that is the reality that we are in relationship with other people, but we are also in relationship to ourselves. And um, what about the importance of self-forgiveness, particularly for those who uh, live with uh, mental illness and the struggle that they have with that. How would you gentlemen speak to that, to that issue? I'll let Ken start with this. Okay. <laughs> Hard one, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, forgiveness is a very rich and multidimensional process. And uh, my comments focus mostly on forgiving others, but it's connected to the capacity to forgive oneself. It's, it's also, I believe, connected to the sense of forgiveness we feel to God. So we have forgiveness in the context of a number of, um, of at, or a number of levels and that are connected to each other. It's difficult to be able to find compassion for other people if we can't find compassion for ourselves. And conversely, if we can't find compassion for, other, for, for ourselves or for other people, it's going to be difficult to kind of support the compassion we may have for ourselves. So there's some wonderful work out there on self-forgiveness and self-compassion that really involves its own um, process. And I would encourage people to look at that. There's some beautiful work by Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, who's done wonderful studies on how do we foster compassion within ourselves. And that may be another prelude to the forgiveness of other people. One thing I would add to that uh, is, you know, we like to say in the, in the interpersonal neurobiology world that we can't give to anybody what we haven't 
yet received. And including what it is that I want to do for myself. We like to say that, you know, when a, when a three-year-old toddles off to preschool, she takes mom and dad with her in her mind, whether she knows it or not, that she's able to be in the world what she's already received. And in some respects, um, we like to talk about this notion that in order for me to receive forgiveness of myself, my brain literally has to have some kind of embodied experience in which I can know, and, and, and by know, I don't mean just as an abstract knowledge as, as a fact, but a viscerally felt sense of what forgiveness is like coming from somebody else. And what I then practice, practicing compassion, I even think of Neff's work, if I'm gonna read his work, I can imagine him saying these things to me. And in some respects, I'm able to take that in. We like to say we ingest, digest, and metabolize that. And what I practice is going to be something that I'm actually first receiving from somebody else that I then have to take in and make part of my own. Again, highlighting this notion that in order for us to flourish, to receive forgiveness, that I can then practice myself, other people are invariably involved in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more. You both shared the delight and the deepening of our own spiritual life through choosing to forgive, that we become more, um, and that we feel a greater sense of connection to life, God, spirit itself. Can you talk about the transformative process onto our own spiritual heart through offering forgiveness? Well, I, I can start this uh, briefly. I would say, um, you know, an, an, an additional, I, Ken, first of all, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how much I loved hearing your talk and those uh, definitions of forgiveness were really rich for me. An additional uh, thought that I've heard of is this notion that forgiveness is choosing not to hold others responsible for one's emotional well-being. But that choice, that decision, that agency, to choose not to picture the things that I picture in my mind, what I sense and image and feel, but to picture something else. Uh, if I'm actually, for, forgiveness actually isn't just the absence of one thing that's bad, it becomes the presence of something else that we find to be taking its place. What am I gonna sense and image and feel of others filling up my sense of strength, even in the face of these ruptures that have taken place. And so from my standpoint, I think we would say it looks a little like what happens when we repair ruptures, that there is a literally a neural growth in the resilience of my networks when I'm choosing to forgive because I'm actually expanding my connections to others in the very face of the trauma of the event that has caused me to have to forgive in the first place. I love that, that notion of the neural networks becoming stronger when they've been ruptured. And I think there's a, there is a parallel at the personal and relational level. Um, one of the beauties of forgiveness, I find, is it, it reminds us that um, we're all wounded. Mm, mm. We all are broken. Mm. And we can focus on with forgiveness of others, we're focusing on how other people have wounded us. But to forgive, we also have to remember how we've wounded other people as well. We're all in this together. Uh, but the beauty of it is it's, and um, I'm gonna offer this image from Jap a Japanese art form. And I know Lisa, I've shared this with Lisa. It's called Kintsugi. And it's an art form that consists of putting broken pieces of pottery together with gold filigree or silver filigree. So you take a shattered piece of pottery and you put it together with this filigree. And any if anyone who's listening wants to uh, uh, Google Kintsugi, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, you'll find beautiful examples of it online. And it's a metaphor, I think, for our lives that, that I've found very useful with my clients. Some clients have even called me Kensugi because <laughs> I use it so much. But it's really the idea that in putting together the broken pieces, we can create a work of art a work of art that's more beautiful than the original perfect piece. Because in seeing the broken piece that's reformed, we're able to remind ourselves that we all are broken, but out of our broken pieces that we put together and that other people can help us put together. In fact, we can share broken pieces with each other. Mm -hmm. In putting those broken pieces together, 
we create something that can be a true work of art. Hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. So the question that traditionally comes up has come up again, and I actually love this because what our audience doesn't know is that my dear friend Lisa here comes from a Jewish heritage, and I come from a Christian heritage, and Ken comes from a Jewish heritage, and Kurt comes from a Christian heritage. So we, while we don't have lots of diversity um, in this particular conversation, we do have some diversity. And one of the questions that consistently comes up is um, how these principles apply in uh, minority religions or other, the question specifically was non-Christian um, faith perspectives. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, non-Christian faith perspectives and how they relate to these principles. Ken, you want to start for us because you don't come from a Christian heritage. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to. First of all, I recommend a book that uh, it's called Everyone is Alike. And... Um, it's really written from the Baha'i perspective, but it, it, it goes through the religious writing scriptures from the major world religious traditions and highlights some of the similarities in virtues and values and forgiveness is one of them that almost all the world's religious traditions place some emphasis on the value of compassion to others, forgiveness towards others. Uh, I originally got interested in forgiveness in part because I am Jewish and uh, in, in Judaism, the forgiveness is largely a relational act that we're taught to forgive others in the context of receiving um, apologies from other people. And that it's really a relational process of receiving an apology, then the obligation becomes on the, forgive, the, the person who's been hurt to forgive. And it's seen as much of a sin not to forgive once you've received an apology in contrition as it is to, uh, as, the, as the transgressor committed. But I found that that was somewhat of a restricting point of view because it leaves you d dependent on the, the person who hurt you to forgive, to, I'm sorry, to apologize. And that's how I got interested in reading other writings on it and eventually doing some research. And I edited a book with, uh, co-edited a book with Mike McCullough, who's a leader in this area and Carl Thorson on forgiveness in part because I just was trying to learn more about it. And, uh, and I, I learned a great deal from other religious traditions. And particularly within Christianity, I found the notion of being able to forgive personally, whether or not the person who hurt you is showing contrition, that that's a really important freeing idea that we can forgive whether or not others around us have taken responsibility for their misdeeds. So this is an example, I think, where where we can truly learn from each other's faith traditions. And uh, I'm still Jewish. I haven't converted, but I've been enriched, I think, by Christian thought in this area. And I've been enriched by other religious traditions in their writings about forgiveness. I think that one, one, one thing that strikes me about uh, I mean, religious traditions are ways in which we try to make sense of the world. And most religious traditions in their best forms are uh, trying to make sense of the world in, in, in terms of what many, at least in the West, and, and not limited to the West, but in the West and the East, talk about, I mean, the philosophers talk about transcendentals. We talk about that, which is, that, you know, where do we find beauty? Where do we find truth? Where do we find goodness? Most uh, of us would say, I'm, I'm not really going to be that interested in gathering around a religious tradition that really, um, uh, really wants to make the world an uglier place, makes the world like I hope you know, I don't wake up and say, gosh, I want to go to church today because I want to feel worse by the end of the day than better. I'm not really doing that. And so in that sense, these, I think that, I think that we would find elements in each of our religious traditions that are pointing us to this question of how can we become people of greater, now this, this is from a Christian, this is from a Christian text, but who wouldn't want to become people of greater love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, general self-control, while at the same time, 
being able to be with others who are different than we are in our religious tradition and to be able to say that quite clearly, not in order to pretend that we're the same when we aren't, but in order to actually be with one another when we're really different. And to say, even with those who are different from me, I'm gonna be committed to creating a world of beauty because we might all have in common this notion that one thing that evil really wants to do is to devour us. Evil really wants to have us separate and fractured. Evil would rather for shame to be in charge of running the show and the outcomes of those kinds of things. And so I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I find, as, as Ken has said, I find it great, greatly beneficial to be in spaces with others who are in different religious traditions in order for us both to find greater ways to be kind, greater ways to be curious, greater ways to explore how can we together in our differentiated spaces create beauty in the ways that actually neuroscience would suggest that uh, is a, a better way for us to go. So we have one more question. Um, I'm actually gonna combine two quite like questions. The first is, how does forgiveness relate to trauma? And along those lines, uh, another question held, you both have shared relational models of forgiveness. How might that be translated into the work and process of mental health treatment for our many providers joining us right here? Well, I think the... Uh the uh, part of the um, power of trauma lies in this capacity to reach out and shake us to our core, our core beliefs, our core values. And so um, we struggle as, as a result of trauma and we, and we become disoriented and we can easily lose touch with those um, higher purposes that have guided us throughout our lives. So in the place of the pe people we used to be, we become more dominated by fear, by anger, and by, by all the negative emotions that when they're unable to be re regulated, they can really truly, as I'm sure uh, Kurt knows better than I, they become toxic, mm. these emotions. Mm. And so part of the, the, the mental health work, I believe, is to help people find ways to kind of begin to re-regulate themselves and the negative emotions. Um, and for people who've been severely traumatized, um, thinking of, of people who've been abused, women who've been raped, um, that may take years and years to, to be able to really address, to find some ability to regulate some of the negative emotions. And the notion of forgiveness before those wounds have begun to heal a bit may be absurd and even counterproductive, that the, the focus has to be on dealing with those toxic emotions initially. But then with time, and some people sooner than later, there becomes a kind of uh, opening up to other possibilities and a kind of recognition that you don't want to live a life dominated by negative emotions, that you want to make this, what we've talked about, life transformation that, I, again, I think is akin to a religious conversion from mm -hmm. ang hate and anger and fear to love and compassion and forgiveness. And, and when, when people are ready to make that transition, I believe mental health professionals have a vital role to play in fostering that process. And fortunately, we have wonderful resources out now and wonderful books and all kinds of tools to help people in that process. My mind goes to two uh, images. One is uh, I often, we talk about this with trauma. We talk about the notion that if I had a precious vase that was sitting in one room of my house and I asked you to pick it up and take it to another room in the house where we're gonna put flowers in it, you could pick it up easily and take it. If that vase were to fall over and to shatter, and then I were to ask you, could you please pick up that vase and bring it into the next room? Of course, the work to do that would seem almost impossible. But if we had several people that we're together going to collectively pick that vase up and carefully carry it into the next room and then put it together. And Ken, your reference to Kintsugi is, uh, I think it's brilliant. It's, it's actually a, 
a reference that I use in, in, in the book, my forthcoming book that's gonna be coming out this year, this whole notion of creating beauty in the very places where our fractures are most painful. This notion that in order for us to advance in our capacity to forgive, it really requires a community. So I need others around me to help carry that shattered vase and it may take a long time. That second image that comes to my mind is the interchange between Jesus and his disciple Peter when he asks him, well, how many times should I forgive someone? Seven times. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And the hyperbole is obvious in the sense that it's not just seven different events, but Jesus is saying this forgiveness process is not just something that you do. It's something that you become over a long period of time, and you can't do this by yourself, especially when trauma, as Ken has already pointed out, trauma shatters not just our concepts in the abstract, but it literally disintegrates our neural networks in such a way that the process of doing the forgiving act in the way that we typically have is even neurally compromised. It's very difficult for us to do this without having the practice over time of being in a community that enables us to gradually find our feet, find the ground underneath our feet, especially in response to these negative emotions, such that over that long period of time, we can begin to entertain some of those early processes that Ken listed earlier in this exercise of forgiveness. And with that in mind, I think that, uh, you know, trauma and forgiveness uh, are those two topics that once again highlight that, you know, our listeners might think, well, gosh, how am I as an individual going to do this? And I want to highlight that I am always going to need it to be a, like, how are we going to do this together? Even if I'm the point of the spear right now is the one who has to do the forgiving process. I'm always going to need you to help me pull that off. Closing thoughts. Okay. Well, thank you both. You know, I'll share a story. Um, a number of years ago, there was a very, you know, low-grade, typical little family spat, and with great delight, my daughter, then about three years old, went skipping across the living room. Daddy is going to apologize to me, and it was with great joy and anticipation and ebullience. And I think she was sensing there was an intimacy. There was a um, deepening of the bond, there was a, a great joy in forgiving and being forgiven, in the act of apologizing. Um, there was great love and renewal. And I wonder if just you want to share one last brief thought on the renewal at the relational level. What is a relationship kindled by forgiveness? Well, I'll go first here because I really want to have Ken have the last word on this. I, I want to I just want to say that I've, I've been the beneficiary of being forgiven because I've been married for 34 years. And so I know what this is like. And I have two adult children and I know what this is like. And there is, I, I, can, I can speak just personally to say there is nothing quite like there having been a fracture and having that fracture be repaired, having that rupture be repaired and to know that someone else is choosing to forgive me, that actually I, get, I have the visceral sense that our relationship is not just the same as it was, it's more than it was before the fracture. And it generates an undeniable and unstoppable hope within me that if they can do this for me, that liberates and energizes me to do the same for others in my community, which I long to be able to do. It's beautiful, Kurt. Thank you. Um, we've been doing research uh, on the notion of sacred moments for uh, several years now. And the sacred moments are these moments that are set apart from uh, ordinary moments, even though they take place in ordinary life. They may take place when you um, uh, uh, get a, a loving comment from someone in watching your child take the first steps in, in in the seeing a beautiful sunset or sunrise, sacred moments are, are moments that they're, they stick with us for our entire lives. 
And in some ways, I think of them as un-PTSD moments because mm -hmm. they're as deeply seared into our minds as, as traumatic experiences can be, but they're positive experiences. I think sacred moments are what make life worthwhile. We look back on our lives and we can think about our sacred moments as, the, as a reason for, for being. That's why I tell clients who may be dealing with terrible situations and even in the dying process, that they do have things to live for. And one of the things to live for is the possibility of sacred moments. And it's a long-winded way of saying that for me, some of my most important sacred moments are moments of, that involve forgiving, hmm. apology, uh, expression of that kind of vulnerability that I made a mistake or you made a mistake, but in spite of it, I love you and you love me and we're all together as children of God. That, mm. that to me is a, it creates sacred moments. Mm. So much bigger than our foibles. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Any thoughts? Well, I have so many thoughts that I, there is a time. Um, you have any closing thoughts? We're so grateful to you both. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Pardeman. You brought so much to us, and I know our 2,000 mental health providers, clergy, policy people, thank you. This is part of practice, whether it's in a faith-based perspective, a mainstream behavioral health perspective, forgiveness is the linchpin of our renewal. Absolutely. And we do want to remind you of a few closing items as we finish up our program today. You will be getting an email from the Partnership Center tomorrow. Uh, with the link to today's program. We hope you will share it widely. This has been really a rich discussion. So please share that uh, with colleagues and friends. Um, also want to remind you that our final uh, number six of this webinar series is scheduled for noon on Tuesday, December 8th. And that will be the topic, Spirituality and Community-Wide Crisis building systems to support connection and recovery. Uh, I am really looking forward to that uh, discussion because we have as a nation and frankly as a world, um, we have and are living through a community-wide crisis uh, during the COVID pandemic. And while we are seeing great progress, um, it has been a season of great stress. And so I'm really looking forward to that program on December 8th and hope you will join us. Um, please be in touch with us at partnerships at hhs.gov and make sure you go to that website that Lisa shared at the beginning of the program for the Spirituality Mind Body Institute um, and link up with them as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real joy to be with you, Kurt, and with you, Ken, and yeah. we will close our program now. Thank, Thank you. you.